Good day, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us in person here in Rosebank and online. My name is Lebohang Ramafoku. I'm the executive director at Oxfam South Africa. And on behalf of the Institute for Economic Justice and Oxfam South Africa, I really want to thank you for joining us today um, at this very important um, event uh, where we really uh, launch the report on international financial institutions during COVID-19 lending in South Africa, the context, the, cont the contentions and policy implications. We've got a lovely uh, report um, that uh, the IEJ um, has produced and we are going to hear and more about it from the panel um, that will discuss firstly the presentation from IEJ and then um, from two um, respondents whom I will introduce um, a bit later. And for those that are joining us online, you will receive a copy, a soft copy of the research report. And I think this really is an important piece of work that calls our attention to the role of IFIs in um, um, our democratic uh, 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 processes in terms of our sovereignty as countries. We all know that IFIs have played a crucial role um, in lending during the, the, the uh, pandemic, and it wasn't the first time that they have played such a role. They generally um, help to ensure macroeconomic and financial stability uh, and offer capital financing for high-risk research and long-term development pro, uh, 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 projects. And while their lending practices have evolved over a period of time, we believe that more can be done. And you will hear from the presentation that is going to be given by Kamal that there are a number of key considerations and a number of recommendations that we would like um, countries and IFIs to consider, particularly when we get such big loans. And for me, just as a citizen, and a person that has been in the field of social justice for as long as I, uh, I have been in, the whole issue of transparency and consultation became a key one. Do we know how much money we got during COVID? Do we know what it was spent on? Do we have access to the contracts that our country uh, entered into? And was there sufficient consultation? And does an emergency like uh, the COVID-19 pandemic um, give right to perhaps conditions that our country uh, signed on uh, without us knowing the long-term impact of um, um, uh, the loans that we got? So while the loans that we got from the New Development Bank, from the IMF, from the World Bank, the interest rates were cheaper than what we could have obtained in the market. I do not think, and, and, and I'm sure that is going to be the uh, conversation that is going to ensue that that means that there shouldn't be transparency. And some of these questions need to be asked. So um, what we are going to um, have today is, as I said, we are going to have firstly a presentation by um, Kamal, and then we are going to have two respondents um, from Ricardo and Luandre, as I said, who I will introduce as they um, um, sit and come up um, uh, and to share their views on the topic. And then thereafter, we will uh, open to questions and answers, both in the room and, and online. And we've got uh, people queued in the room here to make sure that we also get questions um, online and then thereafter we will conclude. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great, great pleasure. Um, and maybe before um, I do that, let me thank the partnership that we enjoy with the um, uh, IEJ. 
and acknowledge um, the team that is here led by Gilad who is in the room um, in here and all of our other colleagues from Oxfam South Africa um, who are also joining us and, and, and really other stakeholders that we engage with from time to time and other scholars um, who really uh, are interested in calling our attention to this sometimes abstract issue, but that has real uh, impact on the lives of people, particularly when you, con you consider things like some of the conditions that may call for a reduction in social spending, which will have a direct impact on some of the communities that organizations like Oxfam, South Africa and others serve. So um, I think this is a very, very important um, uh, conversation. And I really look forward to uh, the presentation that is going to be given by Kamal. By introduction, Kamal Ramburuth is the researcher in the IEJ's Global Economic Governance Program. He has a BCom Honors in Applied Development Economics from Wits University. And as a student, Kamal was a co-founder of the Rethinking Economics for Africa chapter at WITS and a member of the WITS SRC. As an elected member of the inaugural Rethinking Economics Members Council, he played a role in bolstering the Rethinking Economics, move, uh, economics Movement internationally. And he has also worked as a consulting researcher at the Southern Center for Inequality Studies and the United Nations Conference for Trade and Development. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Kamal and let's give him a round of applause as he comes to share the report with us. Over to you, Kamal. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lebo. And uh, firstly, I'd like to just thank all of the other authors on this paper. Um, Vui, Zimbali, and Gilad, who, who all played a, a big role in, in crafting this paper, and a big thanks to Marianne, who's also involved in this whole process. Um, just a quick note on online attendance. For those who are, who are online, uh, please just introduce yourselves on the Zoom, and if you have any questions, you, you're welcome to ask them throughout. And then later on, when we go into more of the panel discussion, um, you, we, we, we'll, we'll present your questions to, to the panel. Um, so yeah, again, thank you everyone for coming. Um, this research report um, uh, has like a, 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 a comes from a, a, a process of a lot of interviewing, a lot of discussions. We engaged uh, members of multilateral development banks, parliamentarians, civil society, uh, tr the trade union movement. Uh, we consulted quite widely in, in this research pro process. Um, and part of this report is not just about uh, the new information on IFIs and how they're lent, but also aims to be some kind of a handbook around what the role of MDBs and IFIs are in, uh, uh, in South Africa generally. Um, so just to give a, a quick historical background, um, as was mentioned, multilateral development banks play a kind of separate role to, to commercial banks in that they aim to, they have mandates that are around uh, social questions, around counter-cyclical lending in recessionary time. They're aiming to kind of provide this long-term capital that uh, uh, commercial banks don't really have the incentives to provide. And um, as kind of described by Mazzucato, uh, they have a mission-oriented investment. Um, and historically, I'll just go through a, a kind of historical development of multilateral development banks and IFIs just to kind of make the point that the way that they have been lending and their, their kind of mandates and their approaches to how their capital flows has changed over time. And it all starts with the World Bank in the, in the International Reconstruction and Development Bank uh, in the post-war period. Uh, and in this, in this early period, um, the, the mantra was kind of regional integration, development, and reconstruction from post-war uh, in the post-war period. Um, then moving on to kind of a, a second period of regional development banks, we have the, 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 the African Development Bank um, and a range of other regional development banks around the world. And these banks kind of uh, uh, were aimed as well at regional integration, uh, fixing market failures and those kind of those kind of problems. Then, following this period, 
in the 1960s and 70s, there is this uh, 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 kind of bolstering of the Washington consensus era in the 1980s and uh, 1990s. And this was a period in which there was um, a, a kind of a huge emphasis on uh, by Bretton Woods institutions, which are the IMF and the World Bank, uh, that had kind of a very narrow scope around promoting market forces, reducing state intervention in national economies. And during this time, there was a new wave of support for pro promoting privatization and supporting market-led Washington consensus development models um, that kind of emphasized fiscal discipline, a change in priority of public spending, um, exchange rates being determined by the market, a kind of real mantra of privatization, liberalization, um, that ensued during this period and all kind of regional development banks started to adopt this approach um, of the Washington consensus. And then we move kind of into, you know, this, uh, the, the, the third period of multilateral development banking uh, that, uh, that is kind of typified by the new development bank or otherwise known as the BRICS bank and the Asian infrastructure development bank. Right. And in this third period, what we kind of see is uh, banks that are, are both capitalized and uh, uh, lending to developing countries where the major shareholders are developing countries. Um, and there's kind of this uh, uh, reinvigoration of industrial policy and geographic expansion of member states that is quite, that is quite novel um, of, of multilateral development banks. And I kind of give this broad historical overview to make the point that uh, there's, there, there is no one way that a development bank uh, uh, or international financial institution can, can disperse capital, right? This capital is dispersed with channels that have very specific political, social, and sometimes, sometimes even cultural contexts that define the, the, the terms and conditions of the lending and the way in which the capital is dispersed and the projects on which the capital is dispersed. And uh, I think that this is quite relevant in, in, uh, in South Africa specifically because the new development bank, for example, is part of this new third wave in which between 2015 and 2019, the majority of South Africa's lending has come from the new development bank, right? Um, so this graph just explains uh, uh, the, 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 the kind of distribution of that financing. Um, and as you can see, the New Development Bank had about two and a half billion US dollars of financing, while the African Development Bank had 1.4 billion and the World Bank 1 billion. Um, and then moving into uh, uh, just kind of unpacking this is uh, the, 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 the say or the voice of South Africa in these different institutions varies. So, for example, the voting share of the of South Af of the South African state in the New Development Bank is 19%. We're a 19% shareholder of the New Development Bank, while of the World Bank it's less than 1%, and of the IMF it's also less than 1%. Our shareholding of the African Development Bank is at around seven seven percent. But this all influences the, the voice and, and direction that the South African state is able to, uh, is able to influence these institutions on. Um, and I think it's, it's quite relevant uh, considering the proliferation of lending from these institutions from around 2000 and, 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 uh, and 1718, we see this huge spike that has to do with two things. The first is an increase in lending from the New Development Bank, which is a novel bank. The New Development Bank only came into being, making its first disbursement in 2016. Um, and then of course, the huge uh, increase in lending that came from uh, the, 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 the COVID-19 pandemic. And what we do in this paper and this report is we unpack the, 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 those kind of uh, the, the, the context, the, the rules and the, the, the way in which these funds during COVID-19 were lent. Um, and we do this as kind of a window into looking beyond COVID and looking towards other issues like uh, the ecological and transition whereby we will again see a huge increase in, uh, in lending from international financial institutions. I mean, just to put into perspective, the JET IP 
uh, international partnership includes uh, an 8.6 billion US dollar disbursement um, towards South Africa's uh, transition. And out of that 8.6 billion, about 58% of that lending is being guaranteed by uh, funneled through or, or directly lent uh, lending that is coming from multilateral development banks. And so this report is, is we find to be quite useful in looking beyond uh, the pandemic and into how, how will these institutions lend to South Africa uh, going forward and into the, into, the climate, uh, into the climate crisis, into our ecological transition. So what we did first is we kind of looked at the, 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 the lending of uh, the different institutions during COVID-19. Uh, the lending from the from the new development bank made up about um, I mean the total lending was about 8.8 .8 billion uh, US dollars. Um, we've got three loans from the NDB of about one billion uh, one billion US dollars. Uh, two loans from the World Bank, one at 0 0.7 billion or 750 million, and one at 480 million, um, and a huge disbursement from the IMF of 4.3 billion US dollars. Uh, the IMF disbursement was in twenty uh, was in twenty twenty one the third largest disbursement in the world, and um, and 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 what we did then is we kind of looked at the interest rates of uh, the different loans to make a comparison about which are the most concessional. Um, also, just to make the point that uh there there is uh the only loan that came to south africa from the from ifis during this period was from the african development bank um the rest of them were either in euros or, or us dollars um and it's it, it becomes a little bit difficult to compare the interest rates of the various loans because uh the different loans come with firstly different conditionalities or no conditionalities they have different terms grace periods interest rates um, and even the screen rates uh, that are used are different between you know your Jibar, your Libar and your Sofo, uh, which are uh, which are variable over time, right? So IFI loans are definitely cheaper than what the government could borrow at the time. We kind of modeled uh, the, the interest payments using a standard linear Vasikic model. Um, and what we found was the total interest payments uh, from IFIs, uh, total interest payments over the lifetime of these loans would come up to 45 billion US dollars. Uh, from the new development bank, that would mean 30 billion from our, our loan to the IMF, we'd pay 10 billion over its lifetime in interest payments to the African Development Bank, 1.5 billion and the World Bank, 3.5 billion. Um, with total, again, interest payments by the government of all of these loans being approximately 45 billion US dollars. Um, then kind of what we did is we kind of said, okay, this sounds like a huge number, but let's try to put this into perspective. How much were these IFI loans in comparison to total government sovereign debt, which it only made up about 3.5% of all sovereign debt. And then just to, to, to compare it again to taxation, uh, to say, okay, out of South Africa's uh, tax revenue of about 1.56 1 uh, uh, trillion rands a year, this only makes up about 8.5% of the total uh, uh, revenue that the government collected in 2022. And this was just an exercise to put into perspective to say, these are, uh, there are other ways to mobilize resources in times of crisis uh, and lending from IFIs is not the only way. Um, although at the time the, 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 the interest rates on the IFI loans were at least half or sometimes less than what uh, the government could get on, on the local bond market, um, there is still other ways to mobilize resources, for example, through taxation. And while South Africa did need financial support during the COVID-19 crisis, the amount that it's drawing from IFIs is relatively small compared to South Africa's ability to, to raise funds in other, in other ways. And I think this is also especially important because although the, 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 the rationale uh, from government at the time for needing these foreign loans in dollars in foreign currency was that we had a balance of payments constraint uh, that at the time in 2020, uh, we had at least 
seven months of, of, of foreign reserves uh, that we could draw on. And, uh, you know, the government is only necessarily needs to hold about three months of reserves for it to consider its, its reserve stable, right? And we had about seven months uh, of reserves. Um, and I think it's especially important when considering the fact that a depreciation of the RAND could be so large, as we've seen in the last two weeks, that the cost of foreign dollar denominated loans becomes greater than the source of RAND denominated financing, like local bond market, tax revenue, um, and other forms of financing. <laughs> Um, and I think this is this is important for two reasons. The first is obviously the the, the exchange rate risk that we've seen is so dangerous, um, and two because of this question of conditionalities. Um, and here I, I point to 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 a, quite an old cartoon um, that kind of says, "I claim this land in the name of His Majesty," uh, you know, an old colonial soldier, and another. Uh, one on the left that says, I structurally adjust this land in the name of economic growth, right? Um, and I just want to uh, uh, raise the, the, the issue of, of, of structural adjustment uh, or, or conditionality. Uh, some of the terminology that's used uh, more recently by the World Bank is prior actions, right? Um, which are part of the World Bank's development policy operations which came into being in around 2004. But this DPO, this development policy operation has historical lineage in programs like the structural adjustment loans and the sectoral ad adjustment loans uh, that came about during the 1970s uh, through which I I'm sure we're all familiar of, of uh, uh, the, the, the structural adjustment, especially in the African context. But also just to make the point that you know, it, it's not the, the logic behind the structural adjustment and conditionalities is that governments aren't able to pay back these loans if they don't make certain permanent changes to their economies that kind of uh, sing to the same tune as the Washington consensus, right? And which from our research, we find uh, a lot of the conditionalities are, are quite similar uh, to that same song. Um, but also just to make the point that when the World Bank was initiated, uh, it didn't, uh, you know, these programs didn't have harsh conditionalities as they, as some of them do, uh, did during the 1980s. And in fact, since between, 1940, between the 1940s and the 1970s, a lot of uh, the World Bank's uh, uh, projects were, was mostly focused on infrastructure and without these kind of conditionalities. Um, and you know, just to make the point again, as the slide explains, that conditionalities have been proven to undermine policy space that at least in South Africa should be made by citizens democratically. Conditionalities on loans between IFIs and the state impose on the sovereignty of national policymaking and enforcement systems. And by doing so undermine the democratic design of the social contract between citizens and the state. Um, and then just to make the point, uh, I mean, while this cartoon does speak of, of structural adjustment uh, and, the, and the person holding the flag does say the IMF, just to make the point that the IMF's lending to South Africa during COVID-19 was a rapid financing instrument, uh, which didn't itself have uh, binding conditionalities, while the World Bank's loans did have binding conditionalities. Um, what the IMF does uh, instead is it has quite similar lending advice to the World Bank in what uh, uh, in, in the kind of the government was obliged to sign this letter of intent that identified the sort of policy recommendations that the government intends to to follow. But also just to make the point that this letter of intent that the that the Minister of Finance and the Reserve Bank Governor uh, wrote to um, wrote to, to the IMF, that letter of intent has been shown to be often used if future programs are taken on by the government. Um, and those kind of, uh, 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 that letter also informs the policy conditions that are attached to future loans under things like the extended credit facility and standby arrangement instruments. Although South Africa has not, has not undertaken any of those. Conditionality, conditionality can also increase um, significantly after a program has been improved uh, from conditions 
uh, that are added during reviews in, in, in other programs. The Bretton Woods um, institutions uh, internationally, we kind of looked at what has the lending advice and what are the conditionalities been internationally to kind of get a bigger picture of what are the patterns at play uh, around the world. And what we found internationally is that um, both Bretton Woods institutions, both the IMF and the World Bank, pushed for post-pandemic return to fiscal consolidation, privatization, and liberalization reforms globally, uh, and often without accounting for the impact of those, uh, those policies on poverty, inequality, and human rights. The World Bank, for example, a uh, few of the COVID-19 projects globally, um, a study by Eurodad found that eight out of 71 of the, of the World Bank projects supported the removal of financial barriers to access to healthcare, for example, during, during the pandemic, while only a third of the projects planned to increase the number of healthcare workers. Uh, the World Bank's projects continue to rely on policy conditionalities as an instrument for influencing national policies. And some of the prior actions or conditionalities were to enhance the private sector's role in public utilities and ownership of state assets, adoption of new higher tariffs, debt restructuring of public utilities with the government absorbing large proportions of the losses. Uh, they also encouraged the granting of concessions and licenses and uh, kind of reforms to promote the use of public private partnerships. The IMF, on the other hand, while they initially supported large increases in healthcare and cash transfers uh, during COVID-19, this was often on a, a temporary basis, uh, even when it meant higher fiscal deficits and public debt in the wake of the immediate crisis. And a lot of people point to this as, as being kind of a, a, a change from uh, IMF lending historically. And, uh, uh, although there has been this critique that subsequently uh, the fund supported fiscal and public debt consolidation for the majority of countries shortly after. Um, and most loans to low and middle income countries during the pandemic required uh, fiscal consolidation and other austerity measures, a finding by Oxfam. And I mean, just to, to reiterate the point that uh, Lebu made earlier, uh, you know, fiscal consolidation and, and austerity uh, and these programs have real implications on people's lives. I mean, in, in Kenya, for example, under the extended fund facility, uh, uh, the, the, the Kenyan government was required to increase taxes on food uh, and cooking gas, right? This is something that would increase the cost of or, or, of eating, right, uh, very simply. And this is in the context of a country where 3 million Kenyans face acute, uh, acute hunger, right? Uh, so these, these policies have real life implications uh, on, 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 people's, on people's realities. And then just moving to the conditionalities in South Africa, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the IMF uh, uh, program didn't have any conditionality, but it did have strong lending advice. Uh, that was in this kind of letter of intent that was sent to the to the fund by the finance minister, and this strong advice included uh, fiscal consolidation, an end to the social relief of distress grant, the SRD grant after COVID, a limiting of tertiary education subsidies, cutting and containing the public sector wage bill, and limiting expenditure on SOEs. All of nearly nearly all of that advice has been undertaken by the government subsequently. The World Bank's uh, development policy operation, on the other hand, did have binding conditionality, right? Uh, the loan agreement itself states that no withdrawal, so the government can't, will, will not get the money, no withdrawal shall be made of the single withdrawal tranche unless the bank is satisfied, A, with the program being carried out by the borrower, and the program is a set of prior actions, which I'll, I'll go to next, and B, with the adequacy of the borrower's macroeconomic framework. And this is a macroeconomic framework that was developed jointly by a, a, a number of IFIs um, and National Treasury. And this uh, adequate uh, macroeconomic framework, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to in a moment, but includes uh, the kind of lending advice of the IMF around uh, fiscal consolidation and the SRD grant and uh, the public sector wage bull. Then just 
kind of focusing in on the World Bank's uh, policy conditionalities um, or, or, or prior actions as, as the language used by the World Bank, uh, some of the, the prior actions of this World Bank loan that is called a COVID-19 loan, some of, some of the prior actions were related to the, the pandemic. For example, during the pandemic, there was a, the prior action to continue the SRD grant, to introduce a kind of a electronic vaccination data system, direct payments of unemployment cash payments. So these are, you know, were, were related to, to the pandemic, but there's also a whole bunch of, of prior actions that weren't related to the pandemic, right? And this includes approving the financial law, financial sector laws amendment bill, the national climate change bill, um, and also uh, the nationally determined contributions. So those are kind of very climate and financial sector related reforms that weren't related to the pandemic, despite this loan being a pandemic related loan. Um, and also included in the prior actions from the World Bank was the exemption of licensing of embedded generation of installed capacity uh, less than 100 megawatts, which has already taken place, and the opening up of the electricity uh, sector to private players. Um, and I think this is this is a this is an important point to make in that. Uh, you know, uh, there was almost like a whole bunch of prior actions that were snuck into this uh, 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 loan agreement um, that weren't related to the pandemic. And it's, it, it, it's relevant because um, the, the funds from the, the World Bank were only dispersed in 2022, right? It's a, it's a pandemic related loan uh, that we only received after the pandemic up, upon uh, uh, executing these, these prior actions. Um, and it's, uh, it, it, it's relevant, and I'm juxtaposing the IMF and, and World Bank's uh, positions here, particularly because uh, they aligned on the three kind of uh, uh, government actions that followed of fiscal consolidation, which we've seen in the most recent budget, of targeting and reducing the public expenditure on social protection schemes, and of cuts to the public sector wage bill. Um, and the congruency between the Bretton Woods Institution and National Treasury's policy paradigm, I would say, doesn't necessarily validate it. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean that sovereignty was, was maintained. Um, it, it, it's interesting, the, the, the kind of narratives that came after the World Bank loan was taken that, no, this wasn't a, a structural adjustment loan. The government was saying that we were going to do these policies anyway. Um, but ultimately, if you sign a contract with uh, an extra state institution that says that you will follow through on a set of policies in exchange for a certain amount of funding, uh, and you only get that funding after the, 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 the program is executed, I, I, I mean, you can call it, you know, if it smells like structural adjustment, if it, it tastes like structural adjustment, if it sounds like it, it probably is, right? Um, and, and I think that it's also especially relevant because this is in a context where those loans weren't even a huge portion of the overall lending to South Africa, it, it, over the overall funds that South Africa had access to, right? Um, and, and it's not even necessary in terms of multilateral development banking practice. The new development bank, for example, uh, doesn't have any prior actions, doesn't have any strong policy uh, advice, right? So going back to the beginning of the presentation around how there's this emergence of different uh, uh, multilateral development banking, it is possible, as was the case of the three billion US dollar loans from uh, the new development bank, that it, yes, it is possible for multilateral development banks to lend without policy conditionalities, right? And this kind of moves us to the, to, to the new development bank and just a quick discussion of how it aims to be kind of different or, or, or a novelty of the multilateral development banking system. Um, and just to already acknowledge uh, that, you know, a lot of the, the development banks work together quite closely and, and kind of see themselves as an entire system of multilateral development banking. Uh, but that, that doesn't take away from the fact that there are certain novelties from the new development bank lending uh, that show leadership in principle at least. Uh, and the one is around principle uh, 
uh, the principle of member equality, whereby all the shareholders of the, of the new development bank aim to have an equal shareholding. While this is true of the BRICS countries, it's not necessarily true of new countries that are coming into the bank. Um, newer members have far, far smaller uh, shareholdings and, and therefore far smaller say in, in, in the bank's decisions. Um, the other novelty that uh, the New Development Bank aims to, to have is local currency financing. Uh, and this is quite important for uh, alleviating kind of exchange rate currency volatility um, and, uh, um, and, and the access to, 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 to reducing the risk on, on, on foreign uh, denominated debt. Uh, and the aim of the New Development Bank is to have a 30% uh, local currency financing and kind of looking over the bank's uh, lending since its inception, about 40% of its lending has been in, in, in rands to South Africa at least. Um, although the third kind of claim of originality around a focus on sustainable infrastructure, uh, the aim of the new development bank is to have two thirds of its financing being on sustainable infrastructure. There are a lot of questions uh, that I think we should be asking around, um, around what is considered green. And there's a huge amount of uh, kind of greenwashing that's happening, not just in, 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 the, in, the, in private financing of, of the ecological transition, but also that of, of, of multilateral development banks. So there's a huge question around that that, uh, that I think uh, we as civil society have, have a role to play um, in investigating. Um, and then just uh, to, 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 to turn to a question of uh, uh, gender, right, in, in IFI lending, um, and I had a, a brief conversation outside earlier with uh, my colleague from the IMF around what is the role of, you know, these institutions are around gender lending and gender financing, um, and there is this kind of uh, uh, um, push, at least among civil society, around the importance of uh, multilateral development banks and other international financial institutions like the IMF playing a role in, in, um, in ensuring that the, the, the projects that their capital finances does not undermine gender equality. So what we did is we did kind of an assessment of all the IFI's gender policies uh, and we found a range of weaknesses which you, you can read further about in the, in the report, but ultimately we found that they are, are, are quite uh, glaring weaknesses in the IFI's lending um, kind of the way that they understand gender equality, but also in the actual practices. Um, and for example, the World Bank and the African Development Bank have started to develop a, a gender tagging system uh, where they try to identify uh, the kind of gender implications of their lending. However, what we found is not just weaknesses in the policy kind of discourse, but also Weaknesses in when these institutions lent to South Africa, the implications of those on gender equality were very real. Um, and I say this because essentially, you know, the, the, a lot of the financing from, from the IFIs was aimed to target at the SRD grant, right? Uh, so the financing coming from these IFIs went into the general uh, revenue of the state and then, but was, was kind of identified to go towards the SRD grant. However, the gender, the gender kind of policies of these international financial institutions uh, wasn't thorough enough to identify the fact that the SRD grant led to unequal, uh, uh, um, unequal treatment of men and women. So between May 2020 and April 2021, the IFI loans that partly funded the SRD grant excluded caregivers. Right, and and thus re resulted in unequal treatment of men and women, and this is because I mean both the caregiver and the child at the time were expected to survive off of a 450 rand child support grant, which by the way is is below the the the, the food poverty line, but both child both the both the caregiver and the child was expected to survive with this 450 rand. But because it excluded all of the, of the caregivers, because the SRD grant excluded all of the caregivers, only 32% of the recipients of the SRD grant were women, right? Uh, because most women undertake the caregiving role in society, in our society. 
And so you've got a situation where uh, uh, the funding that came from these uh, international financial institutions didn't have adequate systems of identifying the gender implications of the program uh, that was supposed to provide social relief at the time. Um, and and I, 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 there is this kind of discussion about what is this, the state's responsibility of this and what is the IFI's responsibility over this. Um, and I think that the, the, from, from this experience, there was clearly a weakness on both sides, right? And I think both the state and IFI should take responsibility for that. Um, and the, the absence of, of gender respons responsive budgeting amongst IFIs is kind of also in contradiction with South Africa. South Africa has a gender responsive budgeting guideline of the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development, um, which IFI lending was in contradiction of. Um, and this kind of lending that leads to unequal outcomes between men and women is also in failure of section 9.2 of South Africa's constitution for the right of equality. It's also uh, against the, uh, uh, the national convention of the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women in the United Nations. And it's also against SDG 5, this, the a Sustainable Development Goal 5, to uphold uh, uh, gender equality and empowerment of all women and girls. So that's just one point. And, and it, this is also, as I mentioned, it is often difficult to identify the impact of this lending because it, it goes, uh, you know, along with taxes, IFI loans and other revenue goes into the government income and then goes into general expenditure for COVID-19 programs, which made assessing every rand and, and the assessment of the projects quite difficult. Um, this is just a, a brief outline of what the, the projects went towards. Um, which you can find more detail of in the report. But what we did in the report as well is we kind of tried to frame the, the IFI lending within a human rights paradigm um, and with human rights as a normative framework. Um, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Economic Rights at the UN and the Guiding Principles on Sovereign Debt and Human Rights um, have a clear message. And that is that debt should not undermine obligations for the realization of fundamental economic and social rights. Beyond that, they are, they were, we, we also did find a, a range of issues around transparency and accountability. Um, you know, we did find some kind of, uh, for example, the new development bank loan was not available online on the website. The World Bank loans were kind of available without interest rates included on them and the interest rates kept fluctuating. Um, and it wasn't clear what the process was of negotiating those or what the variables involved in determining those were either. Um, there were also kind of these perfunctory presentations at NEDLAC that were considered consultation without real consultation with civil society. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, incomplete loan information on websites, uh, which kind of holds back the ability to have oversight and, and accountability on IFRs. Um, <clears throat> there was also a difficulty in reporting on the use of loans and the impact and, and the potential for corruption and mismanagement that comes out of this. And finally, the lines of accountability between the South African state and IFIs uh, uh, was is not always clear. Uh, for example, how will the South African government hold IFIs to account if they don't uh, uh, um, uh, hold true, for example, to South Africa's uh, uh, gender policy, or if they don't hold true to points of South Africa's, South Africa's constitution. Um, and this has been a, a problem historically that civil society has found, uh, especially considering things like the Madupi loan by the World Bank um, and, and, and other historical events. Um, and just to kind of bring us back a little bit uh, to ask uh, why this all matters is going back to, you know, the question of debt sustainability. Uh, it's going back to ask, uh, you know, looking forward into the climate crisis, uh, you know, debt sustainability analyses of IFIs is not always forthcoming. Um, and while currently South Africa isn't in a, in, a, in a dangerous position around our foreign debt, looking towards the ecological transition, there is significant risk. And considering all of the, 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 the issues that we've raised previously around austerity, around debt, around structural adjustment, looking forward, 
debt is power in a lot of ways. Uh, and we should be concerned uh, about the issues that this report raises around the effect of that power uh, on South Africa's sovereignty, on South Africa's human rights, on South Africa's uh, democracy itself. So those are the main kind of uh, questions. Um, I mean, specifically on democracy, democracy is always undermined by a lack of transparency and accountability. You know, transparency is a crucial first step to ensure that checks and balances are in place. Um, and, and I mean, IFAS also undermined democracy through policy conditionalities without democratic consensus or, or oversight. Um, the commitments made, the prior actions undertaken, or to secure IFI financing um, were not kind of considered to unduly impinge on South Africa's democracy. Uh, and we find that this is, this is kind of incorrect in our report. Um, and, then, and then finally, uh, we kind of come to a range of policy conditionalities which uh, we, we, we encourage you to go into more, into more depth in the, in the report. But the first one is just around policy conditionalities and commitments being negotiated, as well as project appraisals need to be tabled in parliament before a loan agreement is made. Uh, we argue that no IFI lending should take place before long-term uh, impact assessment on a country's debt profile is made and to ensure that human rights obligations are met. And thirdly, to ensure that sovereign democratic decision-making and political responsibility for economic policy must remain in the hands of the South African state. Uh, what policy conditionality does is it, it's also kind of, uh, it's almost like a policy lock-in, right? Uh, it's something that even if there is a change of government, you still have these conditionalities that are tied to a previous government, right? And that undermines democratic decision-making. Um, we also suggest that IFIs must adopt gender responsive budgeting in line with gender mainstreaming policy in South Africa. Uh, there's a range of institutional reforms that we suggest, um, and of course, suggesting stronger oversight of IFI loans um, and transparency. But I really encourage you to all look into the report for the finer details of these, of these recommendations. Um, and, just thank, and just to thank once again the co-authors uh, of this of this report, uh, colleagues at Oxfam, um, all of you for coming today, and and of course uh, our discussants who we're very excited to to hear more from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kamal. This is this is such important work. Um, and, and, and I hope that um, the conversation will continue, uh, particularly as we reflect on where our country is at. Uh, what we are going to do now is uh, I'm going to be joined by two respondents who themselves are very key and have done a lot of work in this area. Um, and I'm going to introduce them um, our first uh, respondent who are going to join me uh, shortly is Ricardo Goshak, who is the senior economist of the Residence Coordinator's Office of the United Nations in South Africa. Previously, he was a research fellow of the Institute of Development Studies between 1999 and 2009 at the University of Sussex in the UK, where he also was the co-director of the MPhil program in development studies and program leader of the MA in globalization and development, which he co-created. And between 2012 and, and 2020, he was an economics affair officer at UNCTAD in Geneva, based in the globalization and development strategies division, where he was one of the main authors of the trade and development flagship report he is currently the co-chair of the research stream of financial regulation of development banks, which is part of an international research consortium on public and development finance institutions led by the French AFD and University of Beijing. He has an MA and a PhD in economics from the University of Sussex, and he's originally from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And um, he will be joined um, by uh, Luanze 
Mkadi, who is a responsible investment um, and sustainability specialist in the chief operations office at the Industrial Development Co Corporation. Uh, before this uh, uh, role, she was uh, the program manager with the transformation office at ESCOM, uh, a specialist with the Just Transition Office and an official member of the South African delegation to the UNF Triple She holds an MSc in Resources Economics from University of Pretoria and a PhD in Public Development from Stellenbosch University. Welcome and let's give them a round of applause. I'm going to move over um, to, um, to join the panel and each one will have um, 10 minutes to uh, give their, uh, you know, their initial um, remarks and responses to the report. But before they start, I think for me, when Kamal was presenting, apart from the transparency of the loans, the transparency about confident, um, um, the conditionality, and really transparency around the terms of the loans, what we must also not lose sight of is the mismanagement and the corruption that ensued some of the financing of um, the, you know, the, 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 the COVID response and the many, many SIU reports that we have had around corruption, around PPEs. So it is not enough that we only look at transparency around the loans, but we must also advocate for transparency around even if the terms were perfect around the loans, how are they then uh, used? And I think for me, it was interesting because for me, those are uh, two sides of the same uh, point. But let me give over to you, Ricardo, to respond to I, the paper. Uh, thank you very much, Lendo. Thank you very much for your... <coughs> Is it on? It's on. I think it's more for the online participants. Okay, so let me say a little bit louder. Thank you very much, Lebo, for your kind introduction. Thank you very much for the invite. I was telling Gilad now that, uh, now it's working, that, um, yes, I have this research background, but here in South Africa, I'm really doing coordination work, so no, not much time to do research, so unfortunately not time to go to the Institute, see what you're publishing, what you're doing, but what happens is that from time to time, I come across interviews, uh, material coming from, from this institute, the Institute for Economic Justice, and I think, wow, I like it. So I'm so pleased to be here today. Thank you so much for the invite. And it's a very, I, I read the paper, of course, from the beginning to end. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's a really good piece of work, uh, very informative, a lot of value added. that it really gives us an update of what's going on with development banks. I myself, who, who had been working on that, have lost track of what's going on. So thank you so much for that. It was a real pleasure to read the paper. And yes, as uh, Kamal said, it's a paper on the role of uh, IFIs during the COVID crisis here in South Africa. And uh, of course that it looks at, it weighs the costs, costs and, and benefits of those loans during that period. And, and within that, of course, it highlights the, the costs of conditionality on human rights, budgeting, on gender budgeting, which is very important. I really like that, very informative. The chapter that covers that very well crafted, so well done. Key question, and when I read something, I, my first question is, what's the key question here in this piece of work? And my reading, I may be wrong, the key question is, was it really necessary for South Africa to tap into those, those low ones? That the quick questions, especially in light of how it looks at the costs and benefits. And, and, and one key cost possibly we can put in that way would be the conditionality impinging on, 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 on so, sovereignty and impinging on, as I said, human rights budgeting and, and of course, uh, gender budgeting. Um, and then, of course, constraining policy space. So let me just say a few words about policy space. Policy space has been around for a long time. We all know that at least since the creation of the Bretton Woods institutions, since the creation of the IMF, uh, 
uh, in the case of the World Bank, at the very least since the 70s with the structural adjustment programs. So we've seen that. And my sense is that it's not going to go away anytime soon. And also sometimes we see changes, uh, new thinking, fresh thinking, progressive thinking at the very senior level of some of these institutions, but we don't see that thinking tricking down through the institution itself. I feel there is a lot of bureaucratic uh, inertia resistance to that, or at least it takes change to see any change going down the structure. But for me, the main problem is of course has to do with the main shareholders of the institutions. They don't want change. That's the reality. Uh, some time ago, years ago, perhaps 15 years ago, I don't know, I did some research on that, not uh, looking at loans, but uh, in the context of, of aid from, from uh, traditional donors in Africa. And what we see, what I saw was that uh, for the donor to really decide to disburse uh, the, the aid grant, uh, it wanted the stamp of approval of the IMF over the country's macroeconomic program, macroeconomic framework. That was the reality. And I don't think that has changed since then. So that's the reality we see on, on the issue of policy space. And now last week or this, this week, I don't know, the UN, I'm talking here on, on my personal capacity but the UN Secretary, uh, Sec General, Secretary General has come up with this, um, what do you call, brief on reform of the international financial architecture. And we've been talking about that for so many years. Uh, 25 years ago, I was organizing meetings in London about that, uh, discussions about how to reform in the wake of the East Asian crisis. Then, of course, the term went in disuse. We didn't talk about that anymore. With the global crisis, we talk about reform of, of the international financial system. Now we're back with this terminology. Yes, I have a, a reform of the international financial architecture. Uh, and one of the key issues that the Secretary General raises is precisely uh, to reform the structure power of these institutions. But, I'm skeptical about that. I don't think it's gonna happen. Uh, and that's why then emerging economies, emerging market economies came up with alternative uh, in reaction to that, this difficulty to, to change uh, the way the system works and the power sharing issue. Uh, they came up with alternative institutions, the creation of the new development bank, as Kamal has said, the creation of the Asian investment infrastructure bank, and also creation of different currency arrangements and so on and so forth. So we have now this alternative, uh, which actually comes as a complement to not to challenge, but, but to complement the current uh, structure. So that's the reality we have. Um, um, yes, and let me just now touch on, on the issue of the IMF loan. Uh, I was hearing already in 2020, I arrived in July 2020, they, that on, in that month, but Max is here, he can correct me, was the agreement over that loan. And the, the report says, well, but these loans, we didn't really see an increase in expenditure, uh, uh, social expenditure as a result of these loans. Actually, the IMF was saying, quick, 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 please uh, reduce the expenditure. And uh, that's important. So what's then the rationale behind these loans? My sense is that when we say, and the managing director of IMF was saying, keep spending, keep spending, don't stop it. We need to, to the, the will of the economy needs to continue moving. And, but when we say we need emergency law in a time of crisis, it's not so much to increase, but perhaps not to reduce as much as we see the collapse in revenue. So it's really to sustain the level rather than increase. But in any case, the way I read, the way I remember that the law and really came and it was important to, uh, to support the balance of payments and to stabilize the exchange rate. That's the way I see the role of the law one. And had we not had the low one, then what would have happened to South Africa? Possibly a bit some instability, exchange rate, more exchange rate volatility, depreciation, uh, interest rates having to respond going up. So we don't know. 
Uh, so there was a role for these loans. Remember that in the first three quarters of 2020, there is a lot of capital uh, outflows from South Africa. So these loans did come to have this stabilizing role. And I think one dimension that the report underestimates is really the, the role of foreign capital in supporting the balance of payments and all the stability effects that it has. So uh, the, the report talks about that, but in a very brief way, it doesn't develop that point. I think that's problematic to miss that dimension because that dimension for me is going to be very important going forward if South Africa starts a new cycle of growth. Yeah. I'm going to touch on that again. So it's very important to have that in mind. The World Bank with all these conditionalities, yeah. Uh, um, uh, and then for me, what is really disappointing is see the African Development Bank signing up to conditionality because we think, oh, but the African Development Bank is African bank, so why, why is that? But actually the African Development Bank is not an African bank. It's a bank uh, on, by, uh, by, by Western countries. The main shareholders are not African countries. So they, they call the shots. And, and that's why you see a bank like that signing up to conditionality. But Africa does have an alternative. What's the alternative? I don't think, I think that the report misses the opportunity to discuss that. The alternative is Africa has several sub-regional development banks. You mentioned that in the report, but nothing is said about that. These banks are long established bank, more or less, they came up, uh, they were created more or less at the same time or a little bit after the African Development Bank. This is small, well-managed banks, but they're too small. Uh, they have too little capital. They don't have capacity, they're very conservative in the management. They don't have capacity to lend. They have to be beat up. They have to be capitalized to be able to leverage and lend because only this way then you can uh, support a structural transformation here in the continent. So I think that could be more explored. So to strengthen African banks owned by Africans. I think that's a very important point. Then you have the issue of cost of loans and you compare cost of loans from the IFIs as against cost of loans if the country taps into the domestic capital markets, interest rates are way lower, that's good news. The bad news is that, well, these loans come these loans come uh, denominated in foreign currency. So that's bad news because we've had depreciation costs go up. That's true. Uh, but I think it's also important to look at the maturity because these loans are way less foreign capital coming from those official institutions are way less volatile than private capital. And I think that uh, the paper overlooks that aspect. I think it's important to make that point. Uh, and, and to discuss that. And then there's a discussion, well, but these loans, why not to increase taxation? I think that's a very good point because South Africa is an upper medium income country. I do believe living here in, in Pretoria in a nice neighborhood that it does have space for more taxation, progressive taxation, wealth taxation, and even, which was a very unique thing that during such a crisis that we had, the COVID crisis, actually, um, uh, the country actually on the external sector started doing well because we had the commodity price boom, but no discussion we heard about a possible windfall tax, which we did see in the UK. They did adopt windfall tax in Europe, in other countries. South Africa didn't do anything about that. No discussion. And your institute didn't raise a point or it did. Tell me, no discussion about that, about windfall tax. Look, you're talking about the social relief grant. The social relief for one year, I don't remember which one, was a budget, annual budget for the whole grant of 40 billion rands. More or less the same time we had in the news that Anglo Platinum had was distributing dividends 80 billion rands. If you had taxed 25% of those 8 billion, you could have financed 50% of your annual budget for the social relief of this dress grant. So there was a space for to go in that route. That doesn't mean that that should be the only route. I don't agree with that. I think it's important to tap into those uh, foreign resources. Yes, there is the, the, the issue of, of denomination in foreign currency. Some banks could actually land in domestic currency. The NDB does that. Why? 
is that the other banks don't do that simply because there is a mismatch then for them between assets and liabilities. If they do that, they incur increased costs that eats up their profits, which is bad news actually, because it's good that these banks make profits. Why? Because that's how then they can increase the capital base to be able to leverage more, to be able to lend more, which we desperately need more borrowing from these institutions to support growth and development. But they don't do that uh, because of that. Perhaps the way forward would be that, uh, yes, that the main shareholders, please do capitalize these banks so these banks can lend more. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll be missing some points here. I have to just uh, wrap up. Um, okay, let me carry on. I have just the final point, the currency mismatch. Uh, yes, the NDB does that. Uh, my initial understanding, the AIIB does that actually because it can tap into the Chinese capital markets. The, the interest rates are fine to do that. So you can land on the same currency then in Remimbi. Uh, I don't know about other countries, but anyway, that's something to look into. Um, now, just to finish, uh, going forward, uh, I think that, yes, I think that's really important that you tap into these financial institutions. I'm talking about the development banks. Uh, why? Because what they offer is more stable than private capital one. And the point I want to make now is that South Africa is not growing. Yeah. And the, the current account surplus that you have had in the past two years, it's now turning into a deficit, even without growth. The central bank is projecting a growing deficit uh, alongside very low growth. Now, can you imagine if the country starts to grow rapidly? And if it's a domestic uh, internal market-led growth, what will happen? That the, uh, the, the, the current account deficit is going to get enlarged and you have to finance it. You need foreign capital to be able to finance your current account deficit. So you have to consider that. And if that's the case, well, it's way better to tap into those foreign uh, development banks uh, official land and then go to the private markets, which is way short term, more volatile capital. So think about that. And the final point I want to make is that on the, the fact that these banks do uh, have the, the capacity, the technical knowledge to support transformative growth, you have to tap into this knowledge. When you finance a big long-term complex uh, infrastructure, infrastructure project, which will need, if you want transformation, which you need to support SDGs to which the government of South Africa uh, subscribes, that you need that, you need those loans. You cannot just depend on budgetary resources. Uh, you need a combination of funding to support those projects and, and funding from the volunteer banks is essential. I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricardo. A lot of food for thought. Luanze, your thoughts. Um, by the way, this is for, yeah. So my thoughts, um, first of all, great report. Uh, if you are a researcher like myself, I, I was telling Kamal earlier on, it was great to see the history of where, uh, if you want to know a little bit about the history of multilateral banks and how they've conducted themselves over the years. This is a great report to read. And today I'll speak more as a researcher and less as a, an employee of the Industrial Development Corporation. But for those who don't know about the institution which I work for, um, it's, it's actually one of those development finance institution, which Ricardo was referring to, which was established in 1940 by the South African government with a mandate to focus mainly on industrial development. So the cooperation was there in the establishment of your SASOs, your FOSCOs, and a range of others. And uh, it still has its hands in the steel sector, the automotive sector, your basic sectors, which basically still employ a lot of uh, South Africans at the moment. and. Um, during COVID, I think there were 
the, the, the IDC was able to allocate about 3.36 billion rands uh, to, the, to the various funds that were created around the time. And most of the funds were dedicated to small fund, to small businesses, uh, to assist small businesses around that time. And we all know as South Africans what happened during that time, which you touched on the issues around uh, corruption and all of that. So that's the first part. But for me, uh, the report, after reading the report, I started asking myself, so what now? What do we do? We find ourselves in this situation. But then I also needed to contextualize where we find ourselves. Uh, Kamal touched on this, we are going through an ecological transition as a country. Everyone is talking about the just energy transition or just economic transition or the just transition uh, in its entirety. Uh, we've got the highest level of unemployment rate. Uh, our industries uh, that employ the largest amount of, of South Africans um, are finding themselves under threat. Uh, our export markets, um, you know, if you are going to be, if you're starting a business and you're going to be exporting to the EU, the EU legislation, we are hearing of the new Green Deal that the Americans and the Europeans that are putting in place, which talks directly to the key sectors that have been sustaining us as South Africans. And you add on top of that all these loans that we've taken. What does it what does it mean in terms of the state, in terms of our development finance institution? It talks also the it talks to the transparency and institutional building, which we've sort of neglected as a country. Uh, we went through a phase where we were building institutions and then we stopped. Um, how those institutions which we already had and how, we, how we've managed to actually forget the basics in institutional building, be it on transparency, accountability, monitoring and evaluation. It talks to those things. And, and, and for me, that's how I contextualize the whole paper as a as a next step, I think that we need to take as a country. Uh, we found ourselves in this, the, the loans are here, we've received some of the loans. How do we ensure that the institutions and uh, that are they are accountable and there's some transparency? How do we ensure that we bring national treasury closer to us? Uh, how do we make them accountable? Basic questions, what are the indicators that we're going to put as a country to basically track how these funds are spent, how all of these funds that are being promised as part of the just energy transition, like how are we going to ensure that the recipients of those funds are accountable? And for me, it speaks to also another institution which we started uh, building as a country and we stopped, where we're looking at monitoring and evaluation. And monitoring and evaluation, when you speak to South Africans, if you recall, monitoring and evaluation was supposed to be one of those institutions which was just not going to be at a national level it was going to go to provincial level and you, we also saw a role of municipalities and there was a role of the private sector that we we're defining in that space so taking it home as a dfi those are some of the questions we're asking for and the paper raised some of the things around gender and i'm sorry i'm going to be covering everything all over the place um, as a development finance institution, we're not excluded from that discussion. So if you talk to most, uh, the few DFIs that we have in the country, the question is, what are the indicators that you are putting yourself, that you are communicating to your clients when you are, when you are interacting with them in these new industries that you are trying to drive? If we are to drive the new energy vehicle sector that, uh, if we are trying to transform and transition the automotive sector, which employs, you know, almost every second person in Kabecha, uh, what is it that you're going to ensure that you put in place as a DFI as you invest in those in those sectors? That's one. If you are to invest in the green hydrogen space that we've been partnering with, with a, a range of other private sector players, including Sasol and others, 
what is it that we're going to be putting in place to ensure that issues around transparency, gender mainstreaming, human rights, um, basically, you know, things that are interested to interest that South Africans are interested in at this point in time. What is it that we need to put in place? And that's the question that we are continuously asking ourselves within the corporation. And it, it has uh, forced us to look at the tools that we put in place. People always talk about how difficult it is to access funds from a, a DFI like ours. There's a reason for that. Uh, and But how do you ensure that the efficiency, you know, the efficiencies are there whilst you keep, you still keeping tabs on what you want to achieve as a DFI. So that will be my initial response. The first thing is how do we manage the situation we find ourselves in? How do we ensure that we are putting uh, appropriate monitoring, tracking, evaluation, and reporting protocols in place? How do we keep our institutions um, you know, accountable? How do we ensure that transparency is built in? And how do we continue building institutions as South African? And when I say building, I'm, I'm, mentioned, I'm saying that in a broader context, how do, we, how do we look at the institutions that we have? How do we rebuild these institutions to ensure that they are accountable and there's some transparency so that we are able to actually to drive some of the things that the paper is touching on. Um, so I'll end there and uh, be keen to you. hear you. Thank you very much. I think this has been quite a, a, an, an interesting um, conversation with um, the different questions, including some areas um, that Ricardo mentioned uh, that uh, we could get deeper into in the paper. Any thoughts, uh, Kamal, just yeah, on the issues raised? Definitely. Uh, on the point of, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely, we definitely need to go back to institution building and part of the kind of uh, uh, um, uh, the, the problems that, K, that, that come around IFI lending often has to do with the fact that there aren't dedicated, P there isn't, for example, a dedicated official who oversees each loan um, and the accountability around that, right? Um, and part of that is kind of building the systems, hiring the people, um, that, that, that undertake those functions. And I mean, your point on, um, on, on this trade-off between, um, you know, the necessity of in crises or uh, for development uh, projects or whatever, there is this urgency and we want the projects to go as, as quickly as possible, but there's also, you know, a whole range of, uh, of things that need to happen to ensure that uh, the capital flows in a way that, you know, uh, goes genuinely towards a project, doesn't, I, I, you know, undermine things like human rights. Um, and there is this trade-off because those processes are habitually time and resource intensive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I would agree with that. Um, and yeah. to say that those resources are worth it. Um, and then the point uh, 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 from Ricardo around, um, the fact that you know foreign capital plays an important role in, in stabilizing balance of payments constraints in times of crisis we did we you know we, we might not have got gotten into that in, in detail in the report but it is something that we we acknowledge and we mm. we agree with right um that you know uh I, ifi lending can be incredibly useful in times of crisis it is incredibly useful mm. um and I think the main points that we make in the report isn't to say we should stop lend borrowing from IFIs, mm. the South African state should stop. We're not saying that at all. Mm. We're saying that that lending should continue in uh, ways that, you know, um, you know, we don't take a, a huge loan that might, you know, influence our debt sustainability and that that just happens through a back door through the national treasury. We're saying that, you know, if, if there's a big loan that's being taken, it must be part, tabled at parliament beforehand yeah. uh, so that there is a democratic participation and oversight of that lending. Mm. Um, and, you know, the, 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 we find in the report that the interest rates are lower, were lower from IFIs uh, at the exchange rates at the time, um, at the interest rates at the time, um, but also that those interest rates increased drastically. I mean, they were connected to SOFO and LIBOR and those interest rates have increased significantly since those loans were taken, right? Uh, they're not fixed rates. The only fixed rate loan was from the IMF, which is the lowest interest rate at around 1.6%. Uh, 
but the rest of the loans were connected to uh, screen rates, which along with the exchange rate vary dramatically, you know, um, and with, you know, the, the multiple crises that the world is facing at the moment, uh, those will increase uh, with time it, along the current trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just to agree with your point around regional development banks and uh, their importance um, and the strategic importance of upscaling financing to those regional uh, and interregional development banks that lend uh, at concessional rates without conditionality, that's definitely something that, that we, we would agree with. Um, and yeah, I think that I think that covers. Other than that, you know, just agreeing with a lot of the points that you made, and 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 thank you both for your for your insights and your responses. Thank you, thank you very much. Let's give them a round of applause, please. Thanks. We are now going to open uh, to questions, and I would like to prioritize people online, um, just so that we don't uh, forget them. So I don't know if there are any questions online um, that um, we want to uh, pose to the panel. Um, excellent, thanks. Um, I'm Gillard Isaacs, but I'm, I'm just uh, relaying from the online where there's been a vibrant conversation. Um, and I've grouped these, this is gonna be a whole set. So you guys okay. are gonna have to- Do you wanna do maybe the first three? Yes. And so then I've, they respond and then you- Yeah, so yeah. I've grouped them into four issues. Okay, um, go ahead. If that's okay, I've taken about 15 comments and tried to- Wow, to make that's them, a lot. To, Thanks to, for the engagement okay. online. Um, so the, the first comes from Suraj and Suraj speaks to um, what he refers to as uh, potentially new behaviors by the World Bank and others um, where uh, there is a system of a pre-approval, right? Where countries um, uh, aren't necessarily told to do X, Y, Z, but their e existing policy stance receives a, a stamp of, of, of approval um, in in, a, in, in advance, and, and the World Bank also is in, increasingly behaving as um, a knowledge bank, right, and trying to in, engage countries in that way, and that this differs a bit from the more co coercive uh, uh, structural adjustment um, approaches of, of the past. Um, to, Tobias raises the issues of, of leadership and Seppo raises the issues of um, African states needing to be independent. So the two, these questions which are raised from this first cluster is one, are there new forms and mechanisms of policy imposition, which aren't the same as the 1980s or mm -hmm. 1980s? And what's the relationship between the domestic elites and a policy consensus domestically um, and the IFI elites. The second cluster of issues has to do with the, the loans and the actual financing. Um, Tafatsua is asking uh, what informed, why take these borrowings in the first instance, right? Um, Pusiwa is asking, um, are we actually able to re pay these given the, the crises which we face and pennies noting that that loans also involve outflows um, so there's a cluster of issues there around why and and payback um, the third cluster is around accountability um, penny raises the issue of needing to hold ifis accountable um, uh, uh, Posiwa uh, raises the issue of following money, okay? And perhaps if you can say more in particular about holding IFIs accountable, because that wasn't such a sort of strong focus so far. Very lastly, because I've thrown a lot, um, there's a conversation about engagement. Um, uh, uh, and Mariana, who was uh, previously at Oxfam and, and instrumental in the undertaking um, of this work and a huge thanks to her, 
um, you know, notes that there's been attempts to engage National Treasury um, and at NEDLAC, um, uh, uh, you know, but, but these attempts haven't necessarily yielded what we want. And Danny Bradlow then asks, um, you know, if, if there's, um, uh, um, what might some of those engagement strategies be which we should use? So that's my attempt to sort of summarize. Thank you, thank you, Ricardo. Um, no, Juliet, sorry. <laughs> um, I don't know who wants to take which point. And let me give um, the panel a chance to choose. I would suggest to you start because you know. I'll pick and choose um, on leadership policy that was uh, one of the first questions that I picked up. Uh, that's another key area which I think is linked to the point I made earlier on around institutional building and it would have been great to see first, uh, I think this is part of your future, future work Kamal, to see how you're going to be tracking these loans that we already have. How are we repaying this loan? Who's, ma who's managing the implementation um, you know, who's following on the implementation agenda on this? It's not just about us being able to pay the, the loan back, is, is the loan doing what we wanted it to do in the first place? And this is linked to our policy development processes and the whole regulatory framework, which we used to be good at as a country also in the past. And I think that's another space of work, which I think we need to revisit as economists and policymakers basically look at the policies that we have and the regulatory frameworks. Do they talk to where we find ourselves as a country, where we are transitioning, where we are forced to transition to stay competitive, where we are forced to do a range of things to be able to basically participate in this global you know, world that we find ourselves in. So yes, totally agree with what is being said around policy and leadership that we need to show. I'm not sure whether it's fortunate or unfortunate, the responsibility of formulating policy in this country still stays with the government. However, there's a big role of, you know, citizens, the NGOs, you know, civil society to ask for specific policies, to review policies that we have and basically revisit the regulatory frameworks that we've put in place. That's the first one that I, will, I would, and then the other question, the other issue that was raised around accountability, it's again, it speaks to the policy formulation processes that we have. I mean, if you go to other countries, they tell you how transparent we are and how in terms of our policy formulation based on the processes that we've put in place in our systems. You know, people say it takes long for South Africans to, you know, the you guys are very transparent. You consult on everything that you have. So why are you complaining as South Africans? Why are you not happy with the policies that you've contributed last year on? So it, it, that accountability for me speaks to that. How do we utilize the systems that took us so long to put in place and to build? How do we revitalize, you know, um, not just the private sector, you know, the public to actually, you know, force uh, that accountability in, in these policy spaces. And then it talks to whether do we have the skills, are we building the skills that we should, we should be building around policy formulation, policy development? Is the public made aware by, that's the role of civil society to actually continuously inform uh, you know, the public on where we stand on certain policies, where we stand in various uh, regulatory framework, where we stand on the finances that we're receiving, where they are being spent. I think that for me, it's about accountability that we need to see. Is it okay? Okay, so let's go now. Okay, I'll just pick out, pick out right? One, one question here, which is the one, about African states, they need more, to, they need to be more independent. So I, I just want to stand to correct again to the issue of policy space, the fact that uh, countries talk about constraining policy 
if as a result of conditionality and so on, but countries do uh, need to use the policy space they have. They don't do that as much as they can. And I, I mentioned the loan from IMF, perhaps that it did have this stabilizing role at the macro level. But the question is, was that the only alternative, uh, only choice? Perhaps South Africa did have alternatives, it didn't use it. So for example, capital account management, there's no discussion about that. In previous crises, other countries did use capital account management successfully. South Africa never did that. And no discussions about that possibility in, in 2020 uh, to do that, to use that tool instrument, which is an instrument that the IMF beforehand in previous times was against, but now it supports that. Uh, so, you know, I talked about uh, institution, institution resistance, inertia and so on, but we also see things developing, uh, evolving in some of these institutions. And, but South Africa doesn't do that. South Africa has a very conservative macroeconomic policy framework. So don't complain too much about the foreigners and the foreign institutions. You have to look inside what's going on. Yeah, those are those are great comments. Um, and um, yeah, the, the one question, I think it was from from Busi about whether we'll be able to repay the loans. I mean, yes, uh, at this point, it, it definitely looks like we are in a position to do so. Um, and, you know, the group of questions around um, policy imposition, um, just firstly agreeing with, with what, with what uh, uh, with what my colleagues have said, um, but also the question around is this kind of this receiving a stamp of approval, you know, around uh, the letter of intent and the recommendations and taking them on, um, are they new behaviors in the systems of pre-approvals? Um, and I think that I think the main the main point to to touch on here is that ultimately you lose the, the democratic design of economic decision-making when you go into a legally binding contract with another institution uh, that, as I mentioned during the presentation, you know, once you've made this agreement, um, uh, there can be a change of government, but you still have this agreement. Um, and fundamentally, that is, that is an undermining of both the ability for democratic um, states to change their economic policy, which is the right of a sovereign. Um, and, uh, um, and it comes with a whole range of complications. I mean, if you look at Argentina uh, and the mess that uh, the finance minister there, Martin Guzman, went through in trying to restructure debt from the IMF when his predecessors had taken on the biggest IMF loan in history, it's, it's a real mess. And debt restructuring is a real mess. And it's timely and it's costly. Uh, and it's politically very difficult. Um, and I think that if you have the local capital, why not just avoid that problem? Um, with that uh, uh, saying that, you know, in, it, with keeping in mind that there are instances where, you know, uh, MDB financing is very necessary, right? So it's just to kind of add a nuance to the, to the, to the issue there. Um, and um, the last, uh, the, the other question, uh, I think it was from, uh, Professor Bradlow about what should IFI engagement look like? Um, I would say first there is a, there's a big effort that civil society needs to play in supporting the legislature around these issues um, uh, in terms of like yeah just informing and working with uh, 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 parliamentarians around these issues. Um, but also I think it, it would it's useful to have regular engagements. With, uh, with the executive, with the state, uh, with the IFIs, uh, because I think that often, you know, we can miss each other sometimes, um, you know, sometimes there's, you know, misalignment of information, sometimes there are, you know, misunderstandings, and often just to get a clearer picture, I think it's worth having ongoing regular consultations. Um, I think that's, that's quite worthwhile. Uh, I, I'm sure we're missing some questions in there. There were quite a few, but I hope we've we've answered the majority of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's get into the room and see if there's any questions. There's a hand here. Is there a roving mic? Um, Can I see a mic? 
Yeah, here's my colleague Lipson here with the mic. Thank you. Please name and which organization or yes. group you represent? Uh, Susanna Caputi, uh, diplomat from Bolivia. I'm just uh, following the point uh, that uh, Kamal was indicating about Argentina. I just like to uh, mention that. I wouldn't like South Africa to go through what Latin American countries went through. And uh, I think we've got a longer history uh, from lending from bigger institutions like the IMF, which I am surprised to hear that to this day, they haven't changed their conversation. They're still talking about austerity and how much uh, countries have to tie up their belts. And yet when you talk about their conditionalities, I am appalled to see that after so many years, they are still targeting the poorest of the poor and demanding the countries or the governments to remove social grants. This is really making me sick in the stomach because when you actually look at one of the premises of Cyril Ramaphosa uh, election campaign, where he promised everybody that uh, he was going to reduce the payroll of the government. And why doesn't basically that get targeted and that get uh, uh, on the table? Rather reduce your big expenditure on government salaries. And if you look at today, one of the reasons why the post office is going under is because the big quantity of the problem is the salaries. So th that I have a problem that, you know, I think they have to change their, um, they, they have to modernize their way of, uh, of, of thinking because when you look at austerity, that does not bring progress. It's ex it stagnates an economy. They should actually lend to develop not lend to spend. At the moment, I look. It looks like they are lending just to pay, pay expenditures. Mm. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other input, comment from the room? Okay. Just introduce yourself. Uh, good day, uh, colleagues. My name is Nikita Manyana. I'm an international relations lecturer from the University of Witwatersrand. Uh, so my question basically has to do with how the landscape of the international order is. For instance, uh, I think one of the comments that Dr. Ricardo made earlier on was that this structure might not change right in the near future. So now I would like to uh, understand, is there a way in which uh, the concept of African solutions for African problems can actually be one that can be feasible. In instances where uh, Marlene Kornick, the, the issues that she's mentioned, uh, we can actually find solutions that come from our own continent, right, in terms of borrowing and lending each other. So um, yeah, that's basically my question. Thank you. Thank you. Any view from the two comments uh, from the floor? No, perhaps very quickly that, uh, yes, I think it's possible for, South Af for, for Africa to move ahead, to work together, but it doesn't need to be just, so, uh, sorry, just Africa alone. So you can get together with other players, uh, which is the case of the BRICS uh, grouping. Yeah? And the, the BRICS grouping are doing good things, are reacting, are creating alternatives. And I think that's the way I should, that's the way I think should be the way forward. Thank you. Just to add on that, I think there's a big opportunity for a country like ours to focus on what we've always been known for, industrial development. It's still an opportunity for us. And that speaks to how we would manage the just transition as a whole. Uh, it speaks to how we will ensure that new industries are created. It speaks to how we will transform existing, you know, industries which employ the largest amount of the population. And if we are not able to do this in the next few years, we would miss the boat. So utilizing those partnerships that we've been able to formulate outside, as you said, the BRICS, but also looking at what we have and ensuring that we sustain it, we make it more competitive, we reinvest in what we've already been able to build in the last 
20, 30 years, I think that's, that's the opportunity that I think the time is now. Beyond the next five years, I think we'll be having a different conversation. So the next five years, I think are going to be very crucial on how we manage the systems that we have. We drive accountability, transparency, how we deal with those SIE reports. It's going to be very interesting what yeah. we do in the next five years. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I can see there's questions in the room. Are there any new questions online? Yes, I can see the hands. I just want to check that we don't neglect the ones online. Okay, so let's start. Uh, Livson, let me start with you and then you'll rotate the mic to the other two colleagues who want to ask. Introduce sure. yourself, don't forget that. Thank you. Uh, my name is Livson Mangu. Uh, I work for Oxfam, South Africa uh, in the MND department. My, my question is really around the, the number of IFIs that we have now, does that, uh, does that number as it increases with the NDB, uh, IAEB, I, I, does that increase the competition between IFIs in terms of um, them adopting progressive policies? Because there's now a lot of them that can learn to any country. So does that pressure them to, to reform and allow you know, progressive policies to be, to be implemented or incorporated in their, in their lending? processes. Thank you. Thank you. Please pass on the mics. There were two hands. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you for such an informative session. Okay, now nice. sit. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for such an informative session. Uh, my name is Diana Gamba from One Farm She. So my question is, I looked at the report on page three, there's a, a quote there that says our report finds that all South African loans from IFIs were approved and passed through cabinet in an opaque manner without adequate consultation with parliament and civil society. So the question that I have, well, to the panel and the room and those online is, how can we as civil society be impactful or influential in pushing for change so that these loans are not approved fast and in, in an obiquous manner? How can we hold accountable the government so that SA doesn't end up on its knees in debt like other African states because at the end of the day, we'll be held at ransom by these IFIs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next um, speaker, and then I'll come to you. Yeah. Okay, um, thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation and just for you know, full disclosure, I'm the representative of the IMF in South Africa. So, <laughs> so you, 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 okay. you, you, so you, so you can fire now, but anyway. Um, uh, thank you for the invitation. I think we, we very important for us this kind of dialogue and engagement. However, let me, I will make a little bit of a point of order and I think it's important. When I got the invitation, I said, oh, this is very interesting. I mean, I must go. Although I haven't seen, I didn't receive the report. I only saw it today, so I haven't seen it before. But I think the whole topic is very important. We need to, we need to learn from our engagement, not only our own self-assessment, but other people's assessment. It's very important not, a, not to live in your own bubble looking at yourself. You really need to get you know, other people's. Uh, I was very surprised. You know, I've been almost three years in South Africa. A lot of people in civil society know me here. There's a huge civil society, so maybe you don't know, but there are thousands of people here. But I have collaborated with Oxfam, with you know, many of them. Um, even you know, um, this afternoon, uh, I mean, Kamal knows he's invited. I have, we published our last related reports and then mistress organizing some people from civil society is invited. I'm super engaged with civil society. Even with Oxfam, a couple of years ago, they issued a report um, on climate, you no know, climate funding by IFIs and the IMF in particular. I mean, Elizabeth Cedrop called me. I met with them a couple of times when they launched a report. They even invited me to speak at the launch of the report. <coughs> so I, I think as a point of order, it, it would have been very interesting when you are producing a report like this to talk to us. No one ever contacted me about this. Never. Because if we want to have a dialogue, we need to listen to each other. Because otherwise it doesn't work. There's a lot of factual mistakes that I find here. I mean, I, when you put the number there and see, you're gonna pay a South African $9 billion to the IMF, we lend 4.3 and you're gonna get 9 billion in interest. And I, oh my God, this is fantastic. I mean, I didn't know we we're doing so well. No, I can tell you, 
I make a back of the envelope calculation, for you want to pay us something like 200, let's say $250 million. I don't know the exact number, but how you call me, I give you the answer in one minute. I get it in my computer in one minute, the exact amount with dollars and cents. But I, at, at maximum is $250 million. You say 9 billion, 10 billion. So we need to inflate number by, the, by a 40 times, 50 times. So well, let's say, okay, well, this is not really dollars, it's rand, it's a mistake in the dollar they want to go. Well, even 250 is like 5 billion rand. At today's exchange rate, I'm not even talking that the less than 20 and the dollar has not even reached 20. So do we need to multiply by two? So I think th those things we need to be very careful. The second, I said, well, you launched a report. I thought it would have been natural that I or Marie Francoise from the World Bank or Monali from the National Development from the New Development Bank will have been invited to be at the panel. And we will have presented our views. Again, I'm not saying we're right. And we're, I mean, all of us are very open to get feedback and, and listen. But I think that if we want to make progress, it has to be a dialogue, not just I me mean, we lashing against sales rightly. Right? It doesn't help. We want, we, I think we, we need, we have a common objective. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we may not understand each other, but we want to see the country develop. We may have different points of view on how to achieve that. But the best way forward is if we dialogue and we talk, rather than we confront each other. I don't think we're going to make much progress that way. I'm, I'm going to pick on a couple of things. I mean, I can go for hours on this thing, but we, for, it calls my attention, sometimes some, some tensions. I understand perfectly all this call for the democratic and with the side and the sovereignty and et cetera. This, no, I totally agree with that. But then, then we're to the COVID grant. And it's very interesting. Oh, first of all, on the COVID grant as a parenthesis, I think it was in South Africa was exceptionally well done. People forget on March 2020, we went on lockdown. People are losing employment massively. There are no point to be finessing nonsense. We need people to get money and eat. Mm -hmm. So women now that we didn't target the women and the other, no, forget it. I mean, it was an absolute emergency. The house was on fire. You put together something you needed to put together. And it was put together. And I must say quite exceptionally, we, maybe some of you disagree. But then, okay, they said, well, then we put the COVID grant, but then the World Bank, right? Whatever these banks were lending you money. Don't put conditionality on gender. Well, are we supposed to tell you what to do or we're not supposed to tell you what to do? Because first, we should not be telling you what to do. But it happened that when you come to us with a loan that you design a COVID grant that was designed by the South African authorities in a sovereign way, well, the World Bank or whatever bank was involved should have come and say, oh, no, 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 sorry, you cannot do that. If you yeah. put. So should we tell you or we should not tell you what to do? Yeah. I think mean, there, there are some tensions in this thing. True. And then one more, more thing I found very interesting here. There's some calls about, I would have two more points. One is there's issue about, about governance, corruption, the use of funds, et cetera. It's funny, in all the emergency lending with the IMF did in the context of COVID, South Africa, we lend money to over 100 countries and we disperse over $100 billion because it's emergency lending and we give all the money up front. By definition, there's no conditionality because you know, Europe cannot disperse more, they've got condition nothing. But the only sort of small conditionality was an innovation. We request the required countries to report on the COVID spending, who were they buying these things. We put a number of things that were relatively new in terms of as to ensure the use of funds, what Kristalina Gogoyeva, the money director said, you don't need to spend, go and spend, but keep the receipts. It is the like actual implementation. There are no mention at all. Nothing, okay. Nothing and finally, on the recommendations, I think it will be very helpful, again, in terms of being pragmatic and achieving objectives of what you, is to separate how much, which recommendations are for, say, the governments, your political system, and how much are for the IFIs. Okay. For example, the first one, that, par, that the loan should be tabled in parliament. We, if I, do you want us to impose that? Because no, we no. Not be there. That is something for the South African society to do. And I tell you, my own country, I'm from Costa Rica, in my country, by constitution, all foreign borrowings by the government must be approved by parliament. But we as Costa Ricans decided, we put in our constitution. So all the can we, can we, can we, split them. Can we round up and then just hear from um, um, Kilat? Is there any other questions on the online?
Um, excellent, thanks. Uh, there's been a request uh, by an online participant to make a verbal input. I don't know if that is possible. Um, let us just no, okay, ask them so to it, write it, it on the possible. chat. Okay. Um, I, I would like to make an input. Jeff, yeah, but go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so, so this is in response to the important input from Max. And um, firstly, just uh, there, there is a, very clearly on page 26 that the IMF amount is in rands, not in dollars. There, there is a, an error in that graph so i can see why that is made so that's um yeah um i understand you haven't had it but you have had it for the last hour and a half um you, you know i do think that engagement between in between civil society and um governments the ifis is incredibly important it um is very good to hear a representative of the IMF mm. re-emphasize that and provide a open door. Um, there were uh, a number of interviews undertaken with various stakeholders, which Kamal can um, input on. Um, and it's absolutely fair that one can receive, uh, one could solicit a reviewer input from the um, inst institutions which are being spoken about. But I really don't think it's appropriate for an institution with one of the loudest megaphones in the world to come and whine at a, a civil society event that they weren't invited to be on a platform. I, 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 I mean, really, it's, 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 it's shameful um, uh, uh, to, to uh, I, I, I mean, sure, to come afterwards and, and, and just say, hey, hey guys next time i'd be happy if that suits you if that's what civil society wants if that's the kind of event which you were aiming to to uh, to to uh, to uh, to have and and to have a side conversation with the organizers but but, but to try and 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 you know as a point of order uh, uh, scold the organizers that one of the most powerful institutions in the world was not given a space on this platform, please. I've got no time for that. And I speak as the executive di director as one of the organizing in, um, institutions. Okay, Th thank you. Um... It's quite difficult after that to know where to take this conversation because, in fact, we made uh, this uh, launch of this report public, uh, both for people to be in the room and online so that there can be engagement. And, um, you know, I also think that one of the things that we need to pay attention to is, you know, where we are at in, in this conversation. Um, and, and some of us have a large seat at the table and are constantly in these conversations about issues. What I know for sure is that communities that we represent are not even aware of the implications of all players, whether they are IFIs or governments, around the decisions that they make that have a direct impact on their lives. And I think for me, I just want us to hold that in our minds as we engage. And I do think that there is a place where we can have an internal high level meeting where we could have the president and everybody else that actually has a seat at the table to engage on these issues because I think the right to engage and make sure that IFIs are represented appropriately exists but so does the voice and the engagement of people who have asked the questions. And it's, it's, it's almost telling of the unequal power relations that exist because the comment before the IMF was actually, and that's where I want us to go back to, and I will give uh, IAJ um, Kamal um, a, 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 a right to respond to that. But 
the question was from civil society. And for me, um, in my job, um, um, those voices are equally important. And it's a pity that the person who asked it is leaving the room. Uh, but, but the question was, how do we as civil society organizations actually make sure that there is transparency, number one, on these issues, in a way that various organizations understand it, communities understand it, and they ask the questions that ought to be asked. And as we engage in this, for me, I wouldn't want this event to end by, um, you know, and, and it's interesting that you are both men, uh, that the two men are now fighting, you know, and then we are sitting, which normally happens. Civil society on the main, and that is why the issues of gender that Carl raised, the impact is felt by women, by black women, and by black women in rural. So even as a black woman facilitator, I was like, oh my goodness, the white men or white looking men in the room would not lose the opportunity of just basically saying who's boss. That's how I received it. And that's how I am articulating it. And, and that is why I will call it out and I will even speak about it because often our voices are silenced because the bulls come in and the grass where they fought doesn't grow. So as we correct the stats and we say who should have invited who, et cetera, let us not forget that important principle that the people who ultimately, whether it was the president who's a black man, but a man uh, make the decisions, it is women and mainly black women who pay the price of either lack of transparency, lack of accountability, austerity, and all of that. And as we finalize this conversation and we discuss who did what to whom. Let us not forget that even myself as a black woman, I am not a representative of the black women that are absolutely affected by the issues speaking about. So even as we respond, let us just be cognizant of that truth and that reality. So Kamal, let me give you a chance, but let us also agree that this is not and the, you hold an IAJ and Oxfam South Africa and the I, 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 IFIs have a space and a time and opportunity to go and sit somewhere and have these conversations. But I do think that some things about uh, some inaccuracies in the report have been raised that I'm going to give you short period of okay. amount of time to respond to. But then thereafter, I'm going to give the panel an opportunity to wrap up having listened to some of the questions that are there. Thank you. Okay, Over to great. You. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, I agree we should continue speaking and uh, uh, maybe a bit more humbly, uh, given that we're all kind of, you know, um, we're all kind of, as you say, elites in this room that are talking about issues that, uh, as you mentioned, austerity, it's not affecting most of us in this room, right? Um, and just to be humble about that, and I agree. Um, the question that Leifson asked about competition between IFIs, uh, and I, I, I can speak at least to multilateral development banks because uh, Ricardo, uh, Ricardo, I met Ricardo actually working on this question when I was uh, at UNCTAD, and we interviewed a lot of development banks uh, and uh, the leaders of these development banks. And one of the insights from the chief economist of one of the new banks, the AIIB, uh, for example, Eric Burkloff makes the point that uh, he kind of sees all of these IFIs as being part of a, a kind of network that aims to complement one, one another. And even if you look at the lending to South Africa during the, the, the pandemic, uh, um, there were kind of, uh, there was a common policy matrix that was developed by the multilateral development banks. And there was clearly a conversation about you know, who should lend to which program and what is the kind of general, you know, uh, macroeconomic framework that we want. And there's definitely a lot of interaction between these uh, institutions, the AIIB and the New Development Bank, who, who, who are trying to offer this countervailing power to the traditional Bretton Woods institutions, still co-finance on a lot of the projects. And they, they openly say how they, they work with the World Bank, for example, to 
get as much technical expertise from them as possible uh, and a lot of knowledge from them as possible. So there is an open question and it is a contention uh, around how original, how new they really are, right? So the, 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 it, the, this is a, it's a moving, it's a moving picture, right? And um, that, that question hasn't been resolved and it's an answer that can change over time, right? The same way, uh, the way that, you know, uh, the World Bank and the IMF are able to reform the same way that a new bank is able to come about, uh, these practices can uh, reform. And I think uh, uh, with, 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 with all due respect, it is our role as civil society to point out when things go wrong, right? That is our role. Um, and the executive director of the IMF often says, the, one of the reasons we've changed our ways in the last decade is because civil society has been on our neck, right? And they, you know, she's quite open about being grateful to civil society for raising the critiques, right? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm 100 percent sure that Max sitting over there doesn't see himself as a bad guy. You know, he's not coming to South Africa to take over. You know, that's not how he, he views it. Right. Um, but it is our role to say, hey, Max, these are issues that we find are missing or these are contentions that we find are unfair. Um, and that is exactly why we're sitting here and exactly why we invited you and exactly why we invited the New Development Bank and the World Bank because that is our role as civil society, to constantly point out the things that should improve. And uh, it does come across, the, you know, the last interaction does come across as combative because change is difficult, right? It is difficult to change our ways. It's difficult to be critiqued, right? But it's a discomfort that we need to be a, a little bit more comfortable with <laughs> if we want to really realize progressive values uh, uh, in the developing world. So that's just a, a quick word on that. I, I won't go into anything more except to say on the gender issue, yes, it is a great thing that a special relief of distress grant was dispersed in the middle of a pandemic. But no, it is not okay that only 30% of those who received it were women. That is not okay. That is gender inequality. That is a problem. And it shouldn't be swapped aside because this was a new program. It's something that we must say, this is a new program. It's great that it happened, but it's below the poverty line, but only 30% of recipients were women, right? Um, and and, I, and I, I would just, you know, urge us to, to, to continue to critique the system where it fails. Uh, that's the only way it improves. Um, so that would just be, the, you know, the, the big response on that. And, and of course, we're, we're, we're super open and, and welcoming to further engagements from anyone, from anywhere. It's an important discussion. That's why we're having a launch because we want people to discuss it. Um, and we hope that more discussion comes out of this. So thank you everyone for their inputs. Um, and, it's, and it's great to have everyone in the room. Thank you. Thank you. No, just very quickly, uh, 10 seconds. Just to, you answered the question on more banks in the field. I think that's great that we have more banks coming in. Uh, yes, a lot of complementarity, a lot of cooperation between these banks, a lot of co-financing. That's been great. Uh, sorry, also some more competition, which is also good because you see a new bank doing new things, uh, entering new areas, taking new initiatives, and then you see the West and old established banks re uh, responding to that and also taking similar initiatives. So a lot of good things going on. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can learn a lot from this, and it, this is just the beginning. Um, it will take a lot of, out of civil society to, assist, to transform this economy. Mm -hmm. I don't think the government and the private sector can transform this economy on their own. And this is just one of the many facets that we'll need to manage as a collective. I think for me, that's what I would, that's always on top of my head. How do we work together to transform this economy? And this is the right time for us to transform this economy again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think just one last final point is to thank everybody who stayed with us, those online, those who came into the room. It was indeed a robust um, 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 conversation. Thank you so much for the research and uh, the work that went
into the report. As you said, it's an opportunity for all of us to engage with the report and have further um, conversations. And I do like where uh, uh, Luandle um, uh, um, um, uh, uh, ended around transforming the e e economy. This economy was not developed with everybody in mind. This economy excluded um, uh, the majority of, um, of, of, of the citizens. And in rebuilding this country, we do need to make sure that we transform the economy. Not only do we transform the economy internally, we also transform and call for transparency in the other engagements that we are having with both local, but more importantly with uh, uh, international um, finance institutions. On that note, um, I would like to thank everybody who is here. I want to thank you for your time, for your questions, and we hope that um, you will take these conversations and the report, as I said, the hard copy is available for those who are in the room. The soft copy will be shared with you. And I'm sure it will also be uh, sent to everybody who registered and on the website of uh, both Oxfam South Africa and the IEJ that you will have access to, distribute it, engage it, and ask what responsibility do I have to make sure that the recommendations that are there uh, I carry it forward. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure facilitating the session.